Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Ruby Rogues. This week on our panel, we have Luke Stutters. Hello there. Valentino Stoll. Hey, now. Charles Max Wood from Top End Devs. This week, we have a special guest, and it's Benito Serna. Benito, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Well, I'm from Monterrey, Mexico. I have more or less like 11 years working with Rails and Ruby. I am a mechatronics engineer, really, but... What's, just after graduation. What's mechatronics? Yeah, just a, mechatronics is like a Transformers. mixture. Oh, yeah, sorry. Nah, it's like a mixture between mechanic, mechanical engineer, and also you have some control system stuff mm-hmm. and electronics. Like you have a lot, you and your professional degree knowing a lot of stuff, but not really pretty focused on one stuff. So after one month or six months, of graduation, I, I started to, to learn Ruby because my father, want, well, I wanted to build a an e-commerce site for his company and I discovered Ruby, I fell in love with that and after some months of working with it by myself, I asked for a job and I have been working with Ruby since then. Hey folks, this is Charles Maxwood from Top End Devs and lately I've been working on actually building out Top End Devs. If you're interested, you can go to topendevs.com slash podcast and you can actually hear a little bit more about my story about why I'm doing what I'm doing with Top End Devs why I changed it from uh, devchat.tv to Top End Devs but what I really want to get into is that I have decided that I'm going to build the platform that I always wished I had with devchat.tv and I renamed it to Top End Devs because I want to give you the resources that are going to help you to build the career that you want right so whether you want to be an influencer in tech whether you want to go and just max out your salary and then go live a lifestyle with your family, your friends, or just traveling the world or whatever. I I wanna give you the resources that are gonna help you do that. We're gonna have career and leadership resources in there, and we're gonna be giving you content on a regular basis to help you level up and max out your career. So go check it out at topendevs.com. If you sign up before my birthday, that's December 14th. If you sign up before my birthday, you can get 50% off the lifetime of your subscription. Once again, that's topendevs.com. I worked like six or seven years in an in an agency called Inku here in Mexico. And I have like four years working as a CTO of a company called Brick.mx, uh, also here in Mexico. We are as a, we have as a, a small team, a software development team. We are like six or seven. And we, well, I have a blog uh, that you can find on bhcerna.com. What else? And I wrote a little li- library called Ruby Styler. And that's why you invite me today, I think. Yeah, absolutely. That That is why we invited you. Styler <laughs> looks really interesting. I'll tell you, I love CSS. And by love, I mean don't love at all. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So so yeah. So I saw it and I thought, wow, this this looks really interesting. So yeah. Do you know? Do you want to kind of give us an overview of what it is and where it came from? Oh, is Luke trying to chime in? I was going to say I yeah. refused to use CSS for years. I would actually like take all of the styles and just copy paste them into style tags, right? And then <laughs> when that didn't work, I would just put all of my styling actually in the page between two style tags, right? Instead of having a separate CSS. Uh-huh, file. Yeah. I kind of dragged kicking and streaming into into CSS. You'd be amazed how much styling you can put in the tag. <laughs> you guys are crazy. <laughs> I love CSS. In fact, you could replace CSS with or a lot of JavaScript with CSS. That I That's think is, true. And now. It's very underutilized. My issue is I've spent too many hours trying to figure out why something doesn't look or work the way that I want. And and then I find out that either one of two things happens. I either misunderstood how CSS worked in the first place because it's not intuitive, or more often it's because some idiot put bang important on something <laughs> and I had to go track it down. So now that maybe you were. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not that idiot because I refuse. <laughs> I absolutely refuse. It's like if I need to override it, it's going to go into a style tag so that I can freaking find it. <laughs> Yes, CSS is, is hard. Well, I actually like CSS 
most of the time, but not all the time. Because I think one problem, well, one of the problems that, yes, the, the hardest problem that I have found is working with the cascade, mm. the, the importance of the things. And when you work alone, it's, it's hard. But when, when you work in a team, it's hardest be, because you, as you said, who, how do you find when you work alone or you think that what you wrote, but you don't always know what others wrote. And well, with the cascade, it's hard to, to find that. Well, and starting with Styler, what it is, is a tool to compose CSS classes. Because as I have problems with the cascade, uh, some years ago in Brick MX, we started to work with Tachyons. Tachyons is a library that is very similar to Tailwind CSS. It's a utility framework. I think that it's the name of that. I think Tachyons Tachion is awesome. And one of the things that it brings to your team or to your project is that it provides you with a set of previously defined rules and like CSS classes that are like functions. Um, when you see the site of Tachyons, you, you will find that they talk about functional CSS and it's more or less like what they provide to you. But then when you use Tachyons, you will not have that problem with the cascade, but you will have other problems like a lot of CSS classes in your templates. And then the problem is that now you will not have CSS that break your other CSS, but you will have a big templates that are hard to understand because you will have a lot of CSS classes there and it will be hard to see uh, what parts are for each thing uh, of, in the screen. So you will, one of the solutions to that, uh, the Tailwind proposed to use uh, components or partials if we are in Rails, but partials, in my opinion, are not always a solution. And that's why I, I was trying to play or to create something that will let me like extract the styles, and define define names for those styles, be able to compose them and and use them in my templates. So instead of having like a tag with, I will say some names of classes like padding one, margin two, BG white, color blue, and a lot of a lot of more to define a button. You will again. Uh, can have a, a something that you can refer like just button or blue button or primary button like in Bootstrap, but mm -hmm. using those styles. And you won't have the problem, the cascade problem, because you are composing them like like a list and not by using the cascade. That's more or less the spirit of the tool. Is it clearer for you or not, more or less? Yeah, I think so. I mean, effectively, yeah, instead of doing sort of the tailwind, yeah, where you say, yeah, you have different styles to tell it the the padding and the background and everything uh -huh. else. Yeah, you just you can compose it all into one style and say button, blue button looks like this or base button looks like this. And you can say uh -huh. blue button looks like base button, except for this difference. Yeah, well, that's the spirit. And you will have like in the tool, you have like, one constructor that will let you mm -hmm. build styles like right. more or less like in, in a ship. So you will define a style button and put a list of classes. Then it will build an, an object that you will be able to call like styles.button and will return a, a a string that you will be able to put in the class attribute of your text. And as I said, you you can, for example, define a style button with, uh, let's say, just the padding and the margin. And Tetons have this class called dim that makes an effect when you hover in it. Let's say that you have these three classes, but and then you can you now want a blue button, and that blue button as you can define like a style blue button 
use the styles of the previously defined button by just saying button and you will put button on that list of styles because the previously defined styles will are like interchangeable with or are composable with other plain string styles. So you can uh, mix uh, previously defined styles with other classes and other styles also. And you can also like subtract styles from those previously defined styles. For example, if you define a blue button or primary button that is blue, and then and now you want to define a dang, danger button that is red, you can use the previously defined button blue, subtract the, the BG blue, those the background blue, and add the class background red. And now you will have another style without the need of writing CSS and without the need to reproduce all the previously defined styles. I'm not sure if that makes sense. But yeah, I, I guess the question I have related to that is, can't you just do that with the c- cascading style sheet, right? You have primary button, and then you just override it in the cascade and say, danger is red or danger button is red. So, More or so less. Why do you, so why do you need styler to do this for you instead of just CSS, I guess? Is okay. Question. You will have, for example, in, if you have an a style sheet, you can have a base button and you and you can have a, a blue button. But to have a, well, a primary button, but to have a, a danger button, you will need to put, to share the styles between the primary button and the danger button, you will need to put in this put do, uh, both style names in the same declaration you will need to add like dot primary button comma dot button danger and then a new class to override it but well more or less you can that i think that there's no much benefit on that but one thing that is me well that i think that i need is the ability to to name classes for example I'm not sure if you remember this, but there was a time when the there was a site called CSS Zen Garden. Did you remember that? Do you mm-hmm. remember that? Well, this site was had the idea that you can build a page with with the same CSS but looking very different, like with the same HTML. And different style sheets, you can make the the page look totally different, and that's kind of true. Uh, using things, using classes like very specific classes that re- to express your domain. For example, if you are building a an e-commerce site, you can have like product card or just product item instead of like. If you were using Bootstrap CSS, you will need like card, I'm not sure, card default and some custom class like card uh, product. And that you will need to modify your, your HTML to compose your CSS. You compose your CSS on your HTML. You can't, for example, if you have a, a product card and you have an author card, but those two cards looks just the same or very mm-hmm. similar. The, well, you can do different things. You can just repeat the CSS of product card and copy the CSS of author class, or you can like put product card comma author class card and define it, and then try to modify using the cascade, the pro- but I have a problem with that with the cascade. <laughs> Or you can uh, rename or add another class, let's say company or shared card or just card, and update your HTML templates and to this new like abstract card. And because you can't just keep like defining new CSS classes uh, in using other CSS classes. Well, you can actually. If you use CSS or less, you have these things called mixins. Um, mm-hmm. And with Tailwind CSS, you have this thing called apply. I think a styler is more or less 
like these tools, like apply, includes, or extend from SCSS and Tailwind. The problem is that extend is not really recommended in all cases because it has some performance issues. And apply is not really recommend even in Tailwind CSS. If you have heard Adam Watton, the author of Tailwind, Tailwind mm -hmm. CSS, they don't really recommend apply. And normally they say, uh, he said, says that it is a tool that is that complicates the internals of Tailwind more than they would want. So it is, and I I think because it's it is very hard. It is very hard to like do the thing that those tools make. But but in if instead you just let CSS do what CSS does and you compose classes in in a in your language. I think that is another solution. It's not it is not perfect. It is not the solution for everything. But it's another way and some of the, and maybe the thing that I wanted to propose is like making people think in other ways and trying to explore this possibility. It is not like this tool is the way to go. I th what I wanted to make is a tool to let me express things in something in some different way and trying to make well first my team and and then other people in the world to to think in this other way maybe together we can uh, like make something better right you know benito i, I really like the idea of this i mean it, to me, it makes a lot of sense uh, when you look at it specifically at composability and like removing and, and adding and extending kind of existing classes and structures that apply to specific, like as you kind of outline in your article, themes and collections, right? Uh -huh. And when you think of it in, in terms of SAS as an example, popular, <laughs> popular yeah. library out there. The problem that a lot of us face with SAS is when you use extend or apply, it ends up polluting kind of the the cascade with a lot of these composed, you know, objects in in the cascade itself, and that's what kind of brings about the important that you have to add everywhere, right? When you start to tack these on and and get to kind of some edge cases, and I I think that this is kind of a good uh, way around that. What, what really stuck out to me is this looks like an ideal candidate for something like view component, right, from GitHub, mm -hmm. where, you ha where you have your views in Ruby already, as opposed to a partial. And ha if you could basically mix in the styles using Styler, I think this would be a good complement to that kind of behavior. Yes. Well, I like that idea also. Uh, we don't use yet a view component here in Brick. But but yes, I, I think that is it could be a very clear way uh, to express some components. Also, I think in helpers, we have some <laughs> complex helpers like for collapse elements or for some kind of buttons or dropdowns that help us uh, build the HTML. But the the Ruby is not that clear is is because we are mixing like tags and this content tag from rails and a list of uh, attaching classes that sometimes apply and sometimes don't and if we had now with the styler we can like move the styles and work with the css classes and compose them and put the logic there and then just use and call like css functions or i i don't know how to say that but I don't have a name for for that, but yes, call styles functions that that just are plugged to to that uh, helpers. Yes, I I think view components can can be a way of using of using that because now we have all like all in Ruby. Hi, this is Charles Maxwood from Top End Devs, and lately I've been coaching some people on starting some podcasts and in some cases, just taking their career to the next level. You know, whether you're beginner going to intermediate, intermediate going to advanced, whether you're trying to get noticed in the community or go freelance, I've been helping these folks figure out how to get in front of people, how to build relationships and how to build their careers and max out and, and just go to the next level. So if you're interested in talking to me and having me help you go to the next level, Go to topendevs.com slash coaching. I will give you a one hour free session 
where we can figure out what you're trying to do, where you're trying to go, and figure out what the next steps are. And then from there, we can figure out how to get you to the place you want to go. So once again, that's topendevs.com slash coaching. I like the idea that it kind of puts even even more abstraction layers between me and CSF. It's like you've got rubber. <laughs> it's like you put rubber gloves on so you don't have to touch it directly. And I was looking at one of the articles um, templates, which uh, I'll put a link to, which is on your style attack on example repository where it's just an example of a complete ERB template. Uh -huh. And down the bottom, you can see what it would look like to kind of use this in a in a kind of plausible looking template. And uh -huh. instead of the way I would do, do it in my kind of awful projects is I'd have a load of bootstrap styles in there, right? So I'd have BTN yeah. dash success, you know, or whatever. And my, my whole project, that wouldn't really be relevant to what that button was, but it would be written in, and similarly in, uh, in uh, Tailwind, you'd have these styles here. And the advantage to doing it that way is anyone who knows Bootstrap or Tailwind can come in and know what that does without knowing anything about the project. But the downside, of course, is that it gives you no context or it gives you no semantics, it gives you no meaning for that particular style when applied in that place. So I can't. I, I, I look at this um, at this uh, template you put on the GitHub uh, style attack examples. I kind of like it. I kind of like it because I kind of I like I like loads of custom stuff that new employees aren't going to know. Because the more custom things I can put into my projects, the cleverer I look when new people arrive. Because they'll go, oh, <laughs> I've never seen this before. And I say, no, that's just, just a little something I came up with, you know, just a little kind of new thing, new idea I had. And they'll go, oh, teach me how it works. And then that'll make me feel very clever. So I like anything like that. But <laughs> it, it does, you know, it, it, it maybe isn't the best for the business. So I, it's a very interesting trade-off between <laughs> using these kind of off-the-shelf systems like Tailwind Direct and then putting this abstraction layer in. So with that in mind, with that in mind, you've obviously seen value from this. Yeah. Is this, <laughs> is this, is this running for real or in production on your project? Well, no, I have some uh, like toy projects. I have some toy projects. I have actually, I'm not sure in, I have one little site with, well, the site that you cite in is, is built with the styler. So if you go to the, um, there's a, helpers folder that have a styles hel helper and that is using well the site is using those styles the styles of the of this site uh, are built using styler so i think that's the most like production production -y stuff that that is out there well written by me i'm not sure if someone is using the project elsewhere uh, i want to use it on our system, uh, maybe I will. I will try to introduce it like in the small things, but I will. I need to wait until the next cooldown. We use shape of, but but no, it's not there in production. I think that there is not really a problem with the abstraction or extra layer of abstraction because we are using. Tachyons, or if you want, you can use Tailwind. And you will use Tailwind directly. You will use the sign system provided by, by those tools. So you won't, you won't be writing new CSS. And it will be, as you said, like a joke, it puts a layer of abstraction between you and CSS. So it will be, I think that is easier to break the site if everyone can modify CSS. Mm. I hope that this, this that I'm saying is, uh, could be not true, but I think that it is true that, that if more people on the, on the company modify the CSS at, at will, the site will break more often. And but if you use Tachyons or Tailwind or some kind of utility framework with previously defined CSS classes or function, I think that the site will break 
less. And well, you you will need this layer of abstractions will make things maybe more complicated, but less brittle, I hope. <laughs> so I, I want to chime in on this point because in some ways, you know, you have like tachyons or tailwind that they they are abstractions on top of CSS. I mean, uh-huh. they're just CSS classes, but they're yep. they they simplify a lot of things, right? Bootstrap's kind of a layer on top of that and includes some JavaScript and HTML and things like that as well, right? But if you're using a front-end framework, a lot of times they have an abstraction on top of even that where you have components, you know, React components or Angular components mm-hmm. or Vue components. And and for me, a lot of that makes sense because it's it's granular in the way I think about things. But in my opinion... The only thing worse than CSS is CSS in JS. I mean, I have never found a CSS in JS system that wasn't a huge pain in the butt and that didn't hide details from me that made it hard for me to debug my CSS. So I looked at this and I was like, this seems pretty simple. And because of that, I like it. But I I can also see where, yeah, you know, some of that translation, abstraction, whatever, can get in the way or be a problem. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious, do you intend to keep it this simple? Do you have other features you're looking to add to it? Okay. How do you keep it from becoming CSS in JS that sucks? Well... Or CSS in Ruby that sucks. CSS in Ruby. Well, I think that this is not CSS in Ruby because when you see CSS in JS... When you see, when you see CSS in JS, they actually write CSS or it's like... A, That's true. That is true. Like, Most of the CSS in JS, it's designed to... Build CSS. Tra- yeah, build CSS. And this is not trying to build CSS. This is trying to compose CSS. So you will write CSS as you will. You have been writing mm-hmm. CSS like mm-hmm. from the beginning, but now you, you have like one tool more. So the ability to, talk, to compose CSS classes. I think that this... No, that makes should, sense. I like uh-huh. it. This... I have one, well, uh, you ask what more features I, I wanted to add. I have some ideas, but I, I don't want to, pol- as, as you said, I don't want to pollute this tool like with a lot of things. One thing that I kind of want, but I don't know how to add, is the ability to build tags with these styles. Like, for example, if you call styles.button, Instead of put that styles dot button inside of the class attribute, that you could you could write like styles dot button dot tag or to tag, and just build that button tag. But to build to do that, you will need like a way to define or specify the the name or of the tag in the styler and. I can't, I don't like that. I don't know how to do it. Well, I don't have a clear idea of how to do that. But maybe if if one day I, or someone uh, came with a like beautiful way of expressing that, maybe we can add let's, that to that project. Let's talk about the real okay. thing here. Why do you hate partials? What have you got against partials? This is, this is a problem for a partial. What made you hate partials? That's my question. <laughs> well, I I do like partials, but I think that and I think that one we actually have like an abstractions on top of partials that we called elements to help us build little like little partials, but more or less like view components before view component was popular. And I kind of like that, but there are some performance problems and there are some, like, I'm not sure of organization problems around building partials for every element in in the page. And I think that not everything is a partial because, for example, when you have a, a card, product card, and you will have like the wrapper and you will then have the the photo, some main as a like place with the title title and the description, you can't just make a partial for every piece of that partial. You can have a product card partial, but you but if you also do a photo partial and a and a title partial, I think that it will be a lot. It's another way to decompose the complexity. You can use partials with this tool also. Other thing that other feature that I want is the or that I want to build or to be 
there is the ability to have like snapshots. You are, for example, you are composing those Euro styles with Ruby. These styles are just methods or objects, method calls. So you can pass through each of the methods and build like a file with with all the all these styles or all the answers and build like a file like a snapshot of your final styles it's a st- and then a static you can like style generator i've named it for you it's a static style generator <laughs> more, well, <laughs> more or less because if you have this snapshot and then you change one style you can like run the snapshot again and see and compare and make a diff and see what changes, what changed. I think that that feature can help us to avoid breaking things that we don't want. And it's hard to do that in CSS. And with this tool, it's not already there, but it's possible. And it's not like really rocket science. Building build that with, with CSS is not that easy. Well, at least for me. And I think that those are the features that I want, like the ability to build tags and the ability to have snapshots. You can all more or less have snapshots for complex styles now because uh, these styles, is, you are building objects, so you can just use RSpec or Minitest and test them if you want. I don't know, another question. Yeah, I agree with you as far as uh, granularity you can definitely take partials to an unhealthy level, right? I think view components kind of lend themselves a little bit better to that. Yes. But yeah, if if you can if you can say I just I just want an H1 with this title set of classes that I've composed, then that does sort of solve the same problem and you can make a judgment call as to whether one is overkill or the other is appropriate. Then and, and I'd yeah. have to think about when maybe I'd want to use one over the other. Right now, I just kind of reach for uh, view components as my uh, my Swiss Army tank and uh-huh. just knock everything out with that. But it, it's pretty, yeah, It's I, I could definitely see that. I don't know if I have other questions. Do you guys have more questions? I'd be interested to see if this could go in a, a direction of UX, right? Like taking over interactivity of elements as well, which I know CSS can handle quite a lot of. It would be interesting to see this idea extended to kind of apply interactivity to those styles. So as an example, uh, Tailwinds has animation library or, or features of it. And, and a lot of it, a lot of animations these days are CSS, right? Like if you want to expand an element or uh, toggle a button, right? Like these can all be, or toggle a switch, I mean, like an input element. These can all be animated with CSS. And I feel like that's kind of gone that direction to move away from so much JavaScript, right? And minimize the footprint. So I'd be interested to see how some kind of like interactivity element could be applied with Styler as like an abstraction on your interaction. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I need to work on that. <laughs> I don't know how to, <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Uh, yeah. Well, well, what I'm getting at though is like you've, you've kind of opened up a, a new realm, right? Like of thinking mm-hmm. about the front end from a, yeah. you know, stylistic perspective where like all of us here have gripes with working with the cascade right <laughs> yeah uh, what, what else is possible right yes i think something that could be possible but i'm not sure if it's the right way but maybe goes in the direction of the animation is that we can or we should be able to port this tool to to use opal rb and compile the the tool to JavaScript in some way. A have these styles on the on the client also, and maybe that can help us like to integrate a stimulus with with these uh, styles and maybe able to change them and to call them in the same way that in the backend. Maybe that can help, but. It is not already there, <laughs> but, but but it could be. Actually, I tried to build the tool like in JavaScript also, but well, the expressiveness of the language is not the same. And, and the um, output or the styles file wasn't that that beautiful in my in my 
way of see the thing things. I try it. I think that maybe in CoffeeScript could look better, but CoffeeScript is not that popular now, so maybe porting to Opal is a better solution. I don't I'm not I'm not sure, but maybe that can help. And if someone have ex- uh, listening to the show have experience with Opal, want to help, maybe that could be a good help. <laughs> oh, there we go. Let's do CSS in Opal. In Opal. Yeah. I think I just hurt my own brain. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep Ruby weird. Yeah. All right. Well, other questions, guys? All right. Let's let's uh, let's do some picks. Hey, folks, if you love this podcast and would like to support the show, or if you wish you could listen without the sponsorship messages, then you're in luck. We're setting up new premium podcast feeds where you can get all of the episodes released after Christmas 2020 without the ads. Signing up will help us pay for editing and production. And you can go sign up at devchat.tv slash premium. Luke, you want to start us off with picks? Get a pick on me first. Well, I do have a couple of picks for you this week. The first is after my efforts to learn test-driven development. They've gone very badly, Chad. They've gone very, very badly, my efforts to improve my test-driven development skills. So my first pick is a thing called Report-Driven Development, which was a talk from, I think it was Rails or RubyConf, 2013 we're going back in nine years ago when the world was a happier place and everyone lived in their rep <laughs> that has been really interesting but the, re- the thing i got from that is specifically the pry debugger add-on which lets mm-hmm. you jump up jump up and down your stack and that has been really interesting to get kind of visibility on where i am in the stack when i'm kind of lost in a view or somewhere like that and my second pick is a, an Internet of Things platform called Blink, B-L-Y-N-K. I was visiting a client, and one of his customers walked in who had been printing 3D-printed parts for him to replace now unobtainable small gears and fixings in a kind of fairly expensive kind of hundred thousand dollar manufacturing machine and uh this guy retired gentleman had just been creating the models himself using a 3d free 3d software just making these unusual gears really interesting guy he turned me on to this thing called blink blynk which is an internet of things platform and he'd managed to do things using that platform that I have spent quite a lot of time and uh, certainly quite a lot of kind of Linux knowledge working on, he'd come in and use that to do really quite sophisticated things with kind of his house and home automation. So um, the fact that he was able to leverage that made me really interested in it. Probably not something for developers, if you know if you know your way around a computer, but in terms of maybe you know projects for your kids or people just getting into these things, Really interesting platform. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Cool. Cool. How about you, Valentino? What are your picks? So I have a couple of picks here. Let's see. Uh, first one, one of my coworkers, Dennis Belinsky, he wrote this great article uh, on the Doximity blog about basically taking our Ruby Kafka stack to the next level. So we use Kafka for our inter-app messaging and have been basically moving it away from Ruby Kafka into RD Kaf- lib RD Kafka supported Ruby library. And we've just seen incredible performance improvements. And he, he has a great article uh, writing up how we basically did that. It was a long, long, arduous process. And my next pick is basically Ruby Together. I, I've only recently become a, a member of them, supporting them monthly. It's only 10 bucks a month, so I basically stopped running one of my Linodes <laughs> that I no longer <laughs> use and, and now giving it to Ruby Together, who, if you're not familiar, they manage Bundler and Ruby Gems, and they're slowly making it work incredibly fast and efficient. So if you can, support them. RubyTogether.org is where you can find them. Nice. I'm going to jump in with a few picks. So I've been doing board game picks for the last, I don't know, a few months. Um, so every time I pick a board game or a card game or something like that. And I was talking to some friends last night, went over, played board games with them and was talking about that. And one of my friends said, oh, this game has a weight of like 4.4. And I was like, what do you mean a weight of 4.4? Well, it turns out that Board Game Geek weights the complexity of games. So 
If you go to boardgamegeek.com and you look up a game, it'll tell you how complicated it is to play. So, for example, uh, a lot of people have played Settlers of Catan, right? And so I'm typing it in right now. Wow, they have a lot of versions in here. (laughs) Settlers of Catan. So the Settlers of Catan with the expansion for five to six players has a weight of 2.4 out of five. Okay, so that's how complicated the game is. Monopoly, just kind of to give people an idea, you know, of of where these clock in. Monopoly is a 1.64, right? One of the games that I picked for... Uh, One is low, right? And 10 is high? One is low. Yeah, five is high. Monopoly wrong. So Lost Ruins of Arnak, which is another game that I picked a while back, it has a weight of 2.86, right? So you can kind of get an idea of of where these kind of clock in. So anyway, I'm going to pick Board Game Geek. They have a bunch of other stuff on here. Uh, They have lists of the top games. They have... Um, which made me want to go buy a whole bunch of games because I looked at their list and I realized I haven't played a lot of them. But they also have forums. A lot of times in the forums, there will be clarifications from the game maker in the game, in the forum where it's, how does this card work? You know, and they'll say, oh, well, because the description in there is open to some kind of interpretation or something like that. And so they'll get in and they'll say, it works this way, not that way, right? So anyway, it's it's a terrific place if you're a board game geek to go check it out or to go f- check out board games. Uh, the game I'm going to pick this week is called Taco Cat Goat Cheese Pizza. Cat. Taco Cat Goat Cheese Pizza. <laughs> and it's a card game. Ready. And it, I looked it up before. I think it was around a one cheese pizza. Oh, there man. we go. Google also completed that for me. <laughs> yep. So it's a 1.03, right? So it's not a complicated game. In fact, I can tell you how to play it in like two minutes. So you deal out all the cards to everybody, and then you take turns flipping your top card over. And the first person starts out by saying taco. The next person flips their card and says cat. The next person flips it and says goat, right? Um, And you keep going around until somebody says the thing that's on the card they flipped over. Right. So if I flip a taco and I say taco, then everybody slaps the pile and whoever slaps it last picks up the pile. So that's pretty simple. Right. And then they have three special cards. They have the gorilla, the narwhal and the groundhog. And for those, whenever they're flipped, no matter what anybody says, you do a special action and then you slap the pile and whoever slaps it last gets it. Uh, You win by getting rid of all of your cards and then being the first person to slap the pile. Right. So if you're out of cards and you're the first person left the pile, you win. That's the whole game. And they've got fun pictures on there. And it's anyway, it's a it's a really fun game of playing with my kids. A one usually means that like eight year olds and older can pick it up. We've played it with my six year old and she gets it. She doesn't always do the actions on the narwhal gorilla or groundhog. We usually just let her just try and slap the pile. She winds up with most of the cards because she's not as fast as everybody else. Right. So but it's fun. And she doesn't pick up the pile every time. So anyway, so we, we've really been enjoying that. So taco cat, goat cheese pizza. It'll also tell you how long the games usually last. That one, I think we've 10, 20 minutes is all. So anyway, that's my board game pick. My wife and I also went and saw a movie that we really enjoyed. It was Death on the Nile. It's an Agatha Christie, Poirot. Hey, well, that sounds very um, English. Was it very English? Yeah, I think they had British accents in it, except for Poirot, who's a British actor who had a French accent. But anyway, it, it was good. We, we really enjoyed that movie. It's nice to get back to movies, too. We haven't really done a ton of movies, just mostly because they haven't been releasing them as much. But yeah, we, we went and we really enjoyed that. So I'm going to pick that. And then I just want to let folks know, again, you know, still doing Top End Devs, getting ready to release uh, the first course for Top End Devs, get some of the ongoing series rolling. Uh, we're going to start doing meetups next month. And I'm going to finalize the summit schedule. So these are the online conferences. I'm planning on doing one on Ruby and one on Rails. And I'm probably going to just offset it three months from RubyConf and RailsConf. And the reason is, is because they they offset those. They try and offset those by six months. And so if you couldn't make it to RubyConf or RailsConf and you wanted to go network with people and, you know, see what people are talking about, go to the talks, interact with the sponsors. I'm using a platform that allows for all of that stuff. We'll actually have networking sessions scheduled in the middle of the the conferences. Same thing with the meetups, right? We'll have a a networking time afterward. 
just go to topendevs.com and you can just check it out and you can see when when those are coming up. But yeah, I've, I've really been uh, digging that stuff. I had something else I was going to pick and I can't think of what it was, so I'll have to pick it later. Benito, what are your picks? Let's see. I saw this project called Utopia that is a, a, it's like a tool to build elegantly scaled type and space without breakpoints. Like it, it brings you CSS classes like utilities that will scale your spaces and your phones without breakpoint points. So you, you specify like the size you want for small devices and the size you want for big devices. And it calculates all the spectrum within. So I think it's a cool tool. I haven't used it, but I heard about it last week. So I will share that. I'm not sure what else. Let's see. There is like something that I just saw yesterday, a new gem called Action State that is like a mix between a scope. Sometimes you define scopes in Rails for that represents a state like with the nums. But when you define that, sometimes you need like a, for example, if you have a, an active um, scope and you will pro probably need an active uh, band, a question mark instance method. And this tool uh, makes to you just write a one function and then it can gives you the the instance method it's it's like i think that is a very new tool it has like five days but i think the idea is interesting maybe to explore cool if if people want to connect with you online where do they find you twitter is bh serna my blog is also bh serna.com my github is also bh serna um, and i think that is the way to finding. Awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up here. Thank you for coming. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for inviting me. This was really fun. Um, oh, and I just realized, I just remembered what it was I was going to pick. The last thing is Giphy, G-I-P-H-Y, um, uh, just for finding fun animated images. While we were talking, my my 14-year-old daughter was texting me GIFs. And so we, we, we do that back and forth. They have an app for the iPhone and it integrates with iMessage. And so you can send GIFs easily via text message. And anyway, so, all right, well, we'll go ahead and wrap up here. Till next time, folks, Max out. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com to learn more.